Hello, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this today. Uh, the title I've given this is Additive Manufacturing Today and in the Future. And the, the terms additive manufacturing and, and 3D printing are, are used interchangeably. So if I say additive manufacturing or 3D printing, I'm really talking about the same thing. It's really starting with a, a solid volume, typically a solid model, slicing it and then printing it uh, layer by layer to build a part or multiple parts at once. And uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a very exciting time. And but first I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about our, our small company. We've been in business for 29 years. And, and so I assume you, you're looking at the slides. And so I'm looking at the first one, the title slide, and then I'm going across from left to right and then down. So the second one is um, has our company name at the top and a uh, map of the United States and then a bunch of pictures. And I'm the, the guy at the far left. And then we have some office staff. Uh, we have some other consultants, associate consultants, and so forth. And, and it's mostly US-based, but we have some uh, people in, in Europe as well. And so we're a relatively small company, but we, we tend to work on uh, projects of all sizes. We've worked with uh, many companies over the years. And so the next slide shows companies like HP and, and Nike and uh, Airbus, a, a big aircraft manufacturer that competes with Boeing and, and NASA. We, in fact, we just recently did a design for additive manufacturing course that two classes for, for NASA for their uh, rocket scientists in uh, Huntsville, Alabama to teach them how to uh, design take advantage of additive manufacturing, not for prototyping, but for actual production parts. And uh, that uh, actually was uh, in December and then uh, a couple months before that. One was a four-day class and the other was a three-day class hands-on uh, learning and, and and we had a, a great time together. We hope they have fun to watch. So, for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, what makes this technology so interesting. And, and, and I know that a, a lot of you, I, I understand you're all seniors, is that right? Uh, and so, you've been uh, exposed to this. Some, um, some of you, I'm sure, have uh, had some hands on uh, activity with the technology. So, you, you have some familiarization uh, with the technology. But I'll give you another perspective. And so we'll, we'll look at that and, and you know, how to put the work uh, in industrial studies and then drill the future holds. And then if we have time and what we do, I'm happy to take uh, questions and, and uh, find that to give you answers. So if you look at the history of manufacturing, there's really been uh, two, two ways to manufacture parts. One is formative, where you're you're producing castings, and, and castings are, are, are thousands of years old. There's a picture here of a horse that was cast uh, over 700 years ago, and I know that was 700 AD, so what does that make? A long time ago. And, and so uh, casting is, is one that's very established, and, and, and molding parts, which is another formative process, like making plastic parts and injection mold, that's very so, so it's well established, well understood. Uh, companies, thousands of companies around the world know how to use a formative process. Uh, and then it's a practice where you're, you're starting out with a, a block of material, typically metal, but it doesn't have to be wood, it could be uh, plastic, uh, foam. And you're, you're turning or drilling, milling, somehow removing material. And that's also very well established and understood. Additive manufacturing is relatively new if you look at the entire history of, of manufacturing. It's only been around for about 28 years. And it wasn't until recently that it really is, has gained the attention and respect that, uh, that it deserves, in my opinion. It's been around, like I say, since uh, 1988, but, but now it's getting, uh, it has been for, for now years, uh, media attention and, and a lot of investment by national governments around the world. Some of the biggest corporations in the world are investing in it and developing around it. And uh, it's, it's a very, very exciting time. But, but, we'll, but we don't know as much about it, especially in the context of manufacturing. Most of the 28 year history has been around prototyping, making uh, models and prototype parts to test out their designs, to uh, 
uh, to validate new uh, concepts, to uh, check for form fit and function, you know, to, to look at the form, to, to fit it up against meeting parts, and to see how new designs will function. And that's that's been the majority of the history. But in recent years, in the next frontier, and the big opportunity is to use it to apply it to actual manufacturing for uh, volumes of um, from one to two thousand. So a bit more about that in a, in, a, in, a, in a short time here. So so next slide, what makes additive manufacturing so interesting? So you see some pictures there in the background. There's some lattice and mesh structures and cellular structures and, and, and they're very uh, interesting parts in the sense that you could not cannot form those parts, you couldn't cast them, you couldn't mold them, you can't machine them. They can only be made by additive manufacturing. So that's what makes it uh, unique, makes it different, is you can build these structures that can be very, very uh, strong and rigid, but light. And so it reduces the amount of material and the amount of weight. So, so companies are looking at this seriously. They're also looking at methods of topology optimization, which is letting mathematics decide where to put the material to optimize the strength to weight ratio. And you're seeing some very interesting organic sheets that are being produced that are sometimes 40, 50 percent lighter and less material, which are very attractive for uh, aircraft uh, parts. And so companies like Boeing Aircraft and then the engine makers like GE Aviation, Pratt Whitney, and, and many, many others are all over this and investing uh, a lot in this. Uh, and, and so, but in, in all of, in most of these cases, it's really looking at it for production parts, not. Uh, well, they use it certainly for, for prototyping and testing, but then now they're looking at, at it for, for manufacturing. And that's where the money is, it's in manufacturing. As important as prototyping is, and it really is, it's very important to use this technology or a technology uh, or, or our family. You know, it's important to prototype it, to get the, to get the design right early in the design cycle when changes are least expensive. That's when you want to make changes refine the design early on, uh, and then when you go into manufacturing, uh, you're more certain that you've got a, a, a winning product or a winning uh, design. So, so one thing that makes the, the technology interesting is this complexity, being able to produce these highly complex parts, and being able to, in, in, in the case of Boeing and other companies, they're, well before it would take 20 or 25 different parts and part numbers and tooling and all this uh, maintenance and assembly, uh, they're now taking as many as 20 or so parts and they're they're consolidating them digitally you know, in their CAD software and printing them out. And they can be very complex and convoluted with internal channels and core passageways and so forth. So, so that's interesting, but also it's, it's difficult with traditional manufacturing with this attractive and formative processes to do small quantities because you, you typically have a lot of upfront costs before you make the first part and sell it. You have a lot of uh, capital investment in tools and dies and often gig and pictures and, and other setups. And so small quantities uh, can be either uh, very expensive or just you know off the scale, like not even it's not, it's not an option. But with additive manufacturing, it becomes an option, not for all types of products, but for some. And and, and then. Because of that, you can then do custom products too, or short run, uh, like limited edition products. Like maybe you got a limited edition uh, set of sunglasses or, or jewelry, something of that sort. And then that has, that, that, that's leading to the new types of businesses. We're seeing all types of new companies start up. We're, we're, we're seeing young people like you start companies and, and team up with more veteran people. To, to create new businesses, a lot are, are web-based and, and data-based where they're creating new designs and, and getting them out there and, and uh, realizing those designs, you know, manufacturing them by 3D printing. And, and what, what's really cool about this is that they can manufacture on, on demand. So the traditional way is typically you have all this upfront investment, you manufacture a whole lot of something, typically thousands or maybe even millions of something, and then you say a prayer hoping that you sell these, these products in the quantity that you had forecast. Whereas with additive manufacturing, you can you can come up with a new design 
and you can print on demand, and you can make modifications along the way. Whereas with tooling-based design, like a mold, to rework the tooling can cause major delays, weeks, weeks, and months in the product rollout or it can stop manufacturing. And it can be very costly to do that. Whereas with additive manufacturing, you can go in and tweak the design, and the next day you can be turning out parts. And so there's a lot of businesses that are popping up, and, and so it's very appealing to be able to have these digital inventories rather than having physical inventories that are very expensive uh, to uh, be able to manufacture on, the, on uh, demand. And so we're seeing companies, and I look at the next slide, one called the Guitars. So uh, that's, in fact, uh, I had a picture, if you scroll up, you see a picture of Olaf Deagle. He's the designer of these 3D printed guitars. And in the fact, if you Google 3D printed guitars, almost all, not all, but most of the, the images that you see are his work. And, and we're lucky enough to, to be working with him. In fact, he led the, the, the classes that we did at NASA uh, last year. And, and so these guitars are really cool. He's building them on demand and, and really high, highly complex and, and very expensive. You know, they can sell from uh, $3,500 to, to $5,000 for one of these guitars. And, and they can be custom or semi-custom. Uh, I'm the proud owner of two of, of these. I have the one, if you look at the, the second row, uh, second from the, the, the left, the one that's kind of a yellowish orange color. It's called the high base. And there's bees inside, and it's just a beautiful uh, piece of work. But, this business wouldn't be possible without additive manufacturing because it just, you couldn't build these designs. And, and even if you could, it would be so expensive to, to make all of these uh, different parts and try to assemble them. Like the one, the one to the right of the hive base is uh, it's full of gears. It's even got a, a cylinder with a piston, and a piston that moves back and forth, the connecting rod. So you, you flip the switch and all these gears are turning into that. It's like a, a, a combustion uh, engine where it's moving up and down, and it's all for show. But you know that's what uh, you know the entertainment industry is, is often is, is often for show, and that's what these things uh, are for. They're not only functional, but they're they're good for, for showing off. I should mention too that these guitars, it's only the the, the main body of the guitar uh, that's 3D printed. Uh, a lot of the parts are standard, like the the neck, the strings, the pickups. So those kinds of things are uh, standard that, that Olaf purchases and then assembles. So it's the main body of the guitar, and some of them, in fact, all of them are painted as well. So if they don't come out of the machine like that, there are a couple exceptions. I think the two black ones in the top row, they come out of the machine. Well, no, I take that back. I know they're painted. That's just single black paint because they all come out uh, white. They're, they're using uh, a white nylon powder using laser centering to, to build these. Uh, so the next slide uh, talks about series production. The, the term series production really uh, was popularized in uh, Europe. It, it seems like a, a, if you look on, uh, on most products, uh, you'll see a serial number, and, and that means uh, you know it, it was a, a serial production or series production part uh, versus custom or, or, or prototype. Uh, so so as I mentioned before, that's where this is going is into. Serial production. Excuse me, just a moment. Sorry, I am back. <laughs> and the point of this slide is to show the uh, it, how it's unfolding, how it's developing, and, and that it's uh, it really has has the biggest impact first in the medical and dental industry. The medical for orthopedic implants. The picture to the Right there is the uh, basic type of the cup. It's a hip cup, artificial, it's made of titanium, uh, the alloy CI64. It's a of metals. And these have been made in the tens of thousands, and more than 50,000 of these have been implanted into human patients. And so that's the, the, the forms a, uh, a joint. Uh, and, and so what you're looking at is the stock as part of the joint. And we could talk about that a long, long time, but uh, I'm looking at the clock here, and I don't want to. Uh, Go on too long, but anyway, the medical industry and then a lot of dental parts are being done as well. Such as copings, copings are the main body of a, a crown or bridge, and more than 25,000 of those are being produced every day. And each one is different; uh, they're, they're custom. So if you, if you get a restoration like a crown, um, there's a there's a chance, although it's not quite as popular popular here in the U.S., but uh, there's a chance that it, it would 
the, the, the main body of the, the crown was produced by uh, 3D printing. And, and then aerospace, aerospace is another area that is uh, taken off in a big way, as I mentioned before. What you see a, a small picture of is the, uh, the fuel nozzle for the leaf engine. It's a new generation uh, GE leaf engine. Uh, GE sells uh, these engines to, to Boeing, primarily Boeing and, and Airbus, but for commercial aircraft, but also to other companies too. So, that, so if you look out the window, if you're riding on a you know, jet to California or whatever, uh, you see the engines hanging on the wings. They have, uh, they will have the fuel nozzles, and they, they supply the fuel and the air mixture to the combustion chamber. So it's a very critical part. And there's nine, there'll be 19 of these on each jet engine, and they'll be manufacturing then in the tens of thousands. I mean, what are, you know, it's hard to name a, a part that's that's more critical, and, it, and the, the the environment's very very harsh, and and so. It's interesting when you, you look at the sunglasses and, and the guitars and the, the dip implants and, and the jet engine parts, such a wide range of applications, and, and these are all now production uh, parts. Now, the sunglasses are from a company in Belgium called Hoot uh, Eyewear. Uh, actually, I own a, a pair of these. Uh, they're, they're not custom, but, well, the, the first generation or standard that they are is now scanning, 3D scanning the, the, the face and then fitting the eyeglasses to the face and I expect that someone who had a pair and it looked great on him. And so and there are many other companies too besides this one that are now in fact I just received uh, about two weeks ago uh, in the mail another company, this is a German company called Meyer. And they're also 3D printing uh, these sunglasses. Not of the lenses but the frames. And they're using laser sintering the powder based process. Uh, powder bed fusion is the standard name and, and uh, the same process was used to make the guitar uh, bodies. So let's talk a little bit about growth. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows not the entire history of the bar and the, the bar graph, but it goes back to 1993. That's when we started uh, tracking the, uh, the growth in terms of products and services. You can see that uh, last year was 4.1 billion. It grew by one third in one year. So that's a lot. You know, most industries, if they grow by three or five percent, you know, big established industries, they, you know, they're pretty happy. This grew by 35 percent. We expect similar growth uh, this year. Uh, I'm sorry, 2015. We, we, uh, we haven't done the numbers yet for 2015, but we think it's going to be around five and a half million. And then uh, similar growth uh, for 2016. So it's still quadrupled in size in the last five years. So, so these are all products and services directly associated with additive manufacturing. We can do the machines, the products, the machines, materials, predominantly those two. Uh, but there's some also some aftermarket uh, products like lasers and software and so forth. And then the services of the, 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 the network of service providers out there. There's bureaus, there's companies where you can go to and they you give them a file. And even UPS, UPS stores into this now. So you can take a file to them and they'll or send it to them and they'll uh, give you a quote and they'll fill the part for you. And so uh, that's, a, that's a segment of the, the services or that you see there. Uh, the, the data came from a report that we have been doing uh, for 20 years. In fact, uh, your professor. Uh, Ismail Fighton has uh, helped with the report for many years and has provided a great deal of value and a very important section of the report. And, and you know, thank you again for your contribution to your year. And so we, we published the 20th anniversary edition last year. We're currently working on the 21st edition. And, and you can see by the numbers off to the right there. You know, the, the number of co-authors from different countries and and in the years that that we've had hard data to support the, the estimates and so forth. And, and so we're very proud of it. And that's where these numbers are from that I'm sharing, including the next couple of slides. Well, this next one, the desktop 3D printers, I wanted to share that with you because those are probably the, the, the ones that you perhaps are most familiar with. I haven't gotten a, an update from your professor on the, uh, the current mix of machines that you have there on campus, but uh, certainly educational institutions now pretty much of all types are, are buying these low cost machines, these desktop under 5,000 3D printers, and then the average selling price is much under 5,000. Uh, 
we, we calculate that every year. I'd have to go back and look, but I think it's around fourteen hundred and fifty dollars is the average selling price. It's about under five thousand dollars, three D printers. Now you, 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 you more or less get what you pay for if you buy a fifteen hundred dollar printer, uh, you know, versus a hundred and fifty thousand dollar three D printer. You know, they're two different animals. Uh, but that's that being said, that's a quality that you're getting off of these, these new 3D printers uh, is, is very, very good. I had a student intern last year uh, named Tyler Hudson. He created this uh, ski pole basket. If you're, uh, any of you are snow skiers, but that's uh, the, the, the part of the tip that goes into the snow. And I had these old poles that I, I loved, and I didn't want to get rid of them, but the, the baskets were, were out. So he designed the SolidWorks, the, the prototype in the upper corner uh, that's white, and it was fantastic. But what we wanted was, was a, a tougher, well, not necessarily tougher, but more flexible and tough uh, material. So we went with a, a Ninja Flex, which is a TPU, which is a thermoplastic polyurethane. TPU? So, yeah, I believe that's what it is. Really strong. I've now used the, the, the poles with those baskets for um, part of last season and, and this season, 18 days this season. And, and they're, they're just tough. I mean, it, 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 I don't think you could try to rip that and you couldn't rip the material. But in any case, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to share that is because he spent uh, a considerable time on this. And uh, you know, some of you know CAD and you can do the same kind of work, but I don't think the average consumer or the average home uh, owner uh, will be doing this just because of the skills required. And you know, we had to find a special machine because our little 3D printer in house couldn't run this high, higher temperature material. And, you know, it's about a week, week job, and this is kind of a simple part compared to, you know, some parts that people may, may order to find. So we, we think that there, there's a big consumer market, but it would be consumers going online and, and going uh, to shops and stores buying uh, products that are free to printed. And then they'll, they'll go online and they'll, they'll make custom and semi-custom, you know, they'll go with the tool where you can click and drag and, and you know, modify an existing design, design by stretching or twisting, somehow reshaping uh, an already professionally designed uh, product, but they can put their own little touch to it and uh, hit the print button, and uh, that would be printed you know, somewhere else and then, and then shipped to them. We think that, that's a very uh, uh, a big market opportunity in the future. So back to the slide in the, the bar graph shows the number of these low-cost 3D printers that were sold. Uh, they really didn't come about until around 2007, 2008. A time frame with some FDM apps. FDM stands for future deposition modeling from Stratus, you probably know that. And when those patents expired, then the RepRap project, which is an open source project, came about, and, and that really uh, spawned a lot of startup companies. And and now, uh, well, in 2014, like I say, we don't have 2015 data yet, but in 2014, we think about 140,000 of these were sold worldwide. Now, just to give that some perspective, how that compares to the above $5,000 machine, which is the most of the 28-year history of the industry, uh, 12,850 of those were sold in 2014. So you can see that more than 10 times. Uh, but uh, with that, the value is filled with the industrial machines, uh, the above $5,000 machine. That's the pie chart. Communication is uh, the fact that most of the money being generated by machine sales is by the, uh, the, the you know the more expensive industrial machines. Uh, that smaller segment of the pie will will, uh, will, will get bigger over time, but uh, for now this is uh, the current situation. We think uh, we're we're very upbeat and, and positive about the future of the. We think in some ways just getting started, especially for production applications. Uh, we think that we'll see quadrupling again in the next five years. Uh, and, and the reason this, this money stuff is important is because it, a small, if it's a small industry forever, then big companies and, and government agencies and so forth won't invest in it. It won't, it won't become, and through investment you can drive, drive out cost and drive up quality so you, you'll be able to get better machines and materials at a lower cost. And that's good for everybody. And, and so that means the products that are produced on the machines become a much lower cost. Right now they're relatively expensive. And so that's why this money stuff is important. And and, and then to go to the next slide, the growth potential. <coughs> the, uh, the the 2D printing, and it's mostly documents, but not all documents. I mean, it's hard to pick up a product or anything nowadays. You pick up your phone, you pick up a, a pop can, a, a box that you buy at the, the grocery store. 
there's printing all over that stuff. And, and so HP has been in that business for a very long time. Uh, that business is uh, about 230 million worldwide. Uh, and that's according to Steve Nigro, who's now the, the president of HP 3D Printing, which is a, a fairly recent development. So HP is getting into this, into this, too, into this in, a, in a big way. Uh, you know, so you, you compare that to the global manufacturing economy, which is just under $13 trillion. If additive manufacturing 3D printing penetrates only 5% of that $12.8 trillion, that's a $640 billion industry, a lot bigger than the 2D printing industry. That's you know, precisely why HP is getting into this. They, they believe that that, that could uh, occur. If I could use this, uh, this illustration Steve Nigro did uh, at a presentation I invited him to give uh, in Germany back in September. And and so, uh, oh, I, I guess I used to slide last in uh, Shanghai, so I think I got Dan Ewan, I guess, uh, uh, instead of uh, US dollars to play in it. But, but it means, uh, these are indeed market development, more or less what I, I said before. And then the next slide, and we're, we're just kind of wrapping up, and then we'll uh, turn it over for uh, Q&A, is uh, if, if we look back, let's say from, uh, from now, let's look forward maybe you're all probably, what, uh, 2021, 20, I don't know, if they're seniors in college, something like that. So you're going to be around a lot longer than I am. But uh, so you'll, you'll have the, the, the pleasure of, like, in 40, 50 years looking back and comparing where, you, you know, 3D printing's imprint or its place in history. You know, and it's the question, and we don't really answer. This is just sort of speculation, but... You know, will we will we look back at it in 30, 40, 50 years, and will we put it in the same class as the printing press or the invention of electricity, medicine, telephone, and semiconductor, and so forth? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. My my, my my thinking is probably. I think it could become what this is the next big thing uh, in in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, we talked about the medical industry, but you know, think about loading up cells, living cells from, from the patient and printing them onto a biogradable, you know, absorbable scaffold structure that matches the shape of, of the liver or heart or some or bone, uh, some body part, 3D printing a body part from your own cells. And, and that's been tested and, you know, that's still in trials, but, you know, that's, that's very doable, very possible. I mean, to be able to think of, you lose a finger, you can print off your finger or, or some other body part, it's, it's just uh, astounding. And so... Uh, and, 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 you know, that's, that's just one industry. Uh, think about the food printing industry. I'm sure you've, you've seen some of that. You know, the food industry is big. Now, we're not going to be printing every, all kinds of types of food, but I think custom, you know, chocolates and, you know, uh, cake toppers for weddings. And, you know, there'll be, there'll be certainly uh, an opportunity for that to develop and grow. And, and you know, just the aerospace industry alone is enormous. And so I, I do think that it could be uh, very, very big in the future. So in summary, I'd just like to say that, you know, automotive manufacturing really offers some very special capabilities, and that's why we're talking about it today. That's why um, uh, you know, Professor Biden is, uh, has been, you know, working with us for, for many, many years, and, and, you know, you're very lucky to have him uh, as a professor. Many types of uh, products and businesses are developing, uh, growth is strong. Uh, the, 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 Future, we believe, is is, is, uh, is going to be uh, is going to be great. So you guys are lucky that you're young because you're going to see more of this old unfold than uh, some of us older guys. So thank you for your attention, and uh, if we have time, I'm happy to take uh, take questions from from you. Uh, what part of uh, 3D printing, like additive math, do you think? Well, that's a big question. There there are many many. Parts. And I'm getting the feedback again, so if we get to mute it for, for a moment, uh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of areas. Uh, there's some basic research, fundamental research, certainly that, uh, you know, new materials, uh, better machine technology, you know, coming out with a new machine. Uh, but a lot of the basic research, in my view, uh, has not all of it's been done, but, but a lot of it, there's a lot of foundation work that's there now, sort of the building blocks to really taken it uh, into commercialization. So it's that more of the uh, applied research, taking what's out there and developing new types of products and new types of businesses. And I think that's really maybe one of the biggest opportunities. Uh, and of course, that's 
that's research uh, and, and development. So it's R and D uh, to develop a, a a new application that is commercially viable. And you know we've seen a lot of new ideas, you know, from scanning, uh, you know, people's faces and bodies and you know, putting a tennis racket in their head in their hand and making little little mini me's and bobbleheads and all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, I think the sky's the limit, though. I mean, uh, custom jewelry, uh, a lot of that. But you know, like fasteners are us. You know, or or gears are us. Or you know, you, it could be anything that you come. That's what's cool about this is you, you can really use your imagination and come up with new ideas and put a, a few products out there and see if there's an appetite for it, for them. And if there is, then maybe start a business. You know, you can sell them on. Uh, well, you can open up a shop at Shapeways, for example, and, and, uh, or try to sell them uh, elsewhere. But uh, so I think, uh, uh, you know, just the summary on that question is, is uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's, there's a, a need for, for basic R&D, but I think the bigger opportunity and need is more of the applications, uh, research and development for uh, commercial products. Thank you, Terry. We don't have any more questions.